VMware, located in Palo Alto, California, is going to talk uh, on the topic of the grand challenge, simplifying IT to unleash innovation. Uh, unlike the previous, most of the previous speakers in the series, he's not an alumnus, but I'm sure we would have been very proud to have him as an alumnus, uh, because he represents everything that IIT Madras stands for. Uh, he helps lead VMware's office of uh, CTO. He's a recognized leader within the IT industry, regular keynote speaker, author of many articles on the subject of clouds, IT transformation, and business transformation. Before joining VMware, he spent uh, considerable time at eBay, where he was a distinguished research scientist. And he was responsible for eBay's research into large distributed systems and how to manage them. And prior to eBay, he has uh, uh, architected and developed various software systems, including the Solaris containers from Sun, large-scale B2B e-commerce systems, and large distributed command and control systems. He also sits on the technology advisory boards on many small startups, mature businesses, as well as government-funded consortia. And he, his bachelor's degree in physics is from the University of Manchester in England. And that's why he couldn't get his bachelor's at IIT Madras, because we don't offer a <laughs> bachelor's program in physics. So currently, Paul is leading a global team with a charter to drive thought leadership and to accelerate technology innovation with a focus on business outcomes. Uh, the office works in collaboration with VMware customers and partners, as well as leading academic institutions. So you're at the right place. On projects designed to solve customer problems while advancing VMware's long-term strategy and product development roadmap. So without further ado, I'll ask uh, Paul to come and address the audience. Thank you. It's, it's a great pleasure for me to be here today. Um, I hear vicious rumors that many of you might be revising for quizzes or something. Is that right? In England, the quiz means something slightly more humorous and less serious than uh, sort of midterm tests or whatever. They used to call these periodicals in our time. Periodicals? In England, that's a newspaper, equally trivial and less, <laughs> not something to worry about. So thank you very much. Um, what, I thought I'd, what I thought I'd do uh, today is spend some time really talking around what VMware sees as a company happening around us and how it's driving our technology strategy. I will also talk about technology, and I will take some little side roads during the conversation here around perhaps emphasizing areas where we have specific interest. But what I really wanted to do was talk about the high-level discussion. The reason I think it's really important is there's a very high risk when you're studying for a graduate or an undergraduate degree, it doesn't really matter, that we get very detached from the problems that we actually are trying to solve, that our customers, you know, what we're in the business of doing is building product. We have to innovate, but that innovation has to turn into great product, and that great product is only great because it satisfies someone's need, it solves a problem that is compelling and important for them, or provides them with a business opportunity that they would otherwise not have. And so whilst, personally, when I solve problems and I build things, I get a great deal of intellectual satisfaction from it, at the end of the day, it has to have meaning and value to others and not just to me. And so what I thought I'd share with you is the deck that I have here is actually a deck that I give to CIOs. And when I do large keynotes uh, at VMworld and I have thousands of people or whatever, and this is how I talk about where technology is going. I think it's very important that you understand that broader context for a number of reasons. One, I think, again, it's about products. But two, we as a company want people coming out of academia uh, not just qualified, but understanding the space that we live and work in. Okay? Okay. So one of the things that's interesting about IT and, uh, is that people mean different things by IT. What is it really? I mean, we tend to think of information technology, but in truth, uh, for the last 30 years, I would argue IT has been about infrastructure technology. Most of VMware's customers, when I talk about them, are obsessed with physical infrastructure. The CIO spends all of his time worrying about the amount of server real estate that's taken up and the power and cooling in his data centers and how he's going to make sure stuff doesn't break, rather than doing his real job, which is information technology. What is the real job of information technology? It's to turn data into actionable information and then to act on it as quickly and productively as possible on behalf of an enterprise, a business, a government, an academic institution, if you want to turn around the stuff and do a whole bunch of simulations. My eldest daughter's 22, she's a geneticist. 
She wants to do stuff around genomes and other stuff, right? And you want it to happen. You don't want to care about the infrastructure. You just want to get a result and turn that data into actionable information that you can do useful things uh, with. But ultimately, what we see happening around us today is that we want IT to turn into innovation technology. One of the things I think you are living in, perhaps one of the most exciting periods in history, certainly for those of us who are technologists. My career is 30 years. I sometimes say, you know, I, it feels like it should be about five years. I remember sitting in your shoes, kind of ish, in England, listening to these old guys come up and talk about their youth. Uh, and that only seemed like five minutes ago. The trouble was, it was 30 years ago. Um, and a lot has happened, but I would argue today is one of the most exciting times there's been in IT, because there have been some fundamental shifts and changes, and the assumptions many of us have made for many years have basically been swept away. It's a time of almost unlimited opportunity to change the world and to do interesting things. And I am jealous of you for being where you are right now, because the future is extremely exciting. Okay? Now, it was very exciting for me when I was your age too, but excitement for me meant machine code on Z80. Do you remember Z80? No, some, pe some people here towards the front absolutely do. It had a beautiful instruction set. It was very, well, let's not go there. Um, so the challenge with all about this, and, and VMware, if you know about us, people think of us as a, an infrastructure company, the virtualization company. We bought the thing they did on mainframes uh, 40 years ago, and we put it on a commodity server on x86. But what our customers care about, even though we obsess on solving interesting problems about scheduling algorithms and placement and dependency graphs of things that have to map onto each other uh, to make things real, what our customers really care about is their applications. It's applications that make businesses real, that make organizations real. For those of you in engineering doing simulations, it's your simulation application that matters. You don't want to care that you've got a grid cluster behind the scenes doing anything. It's all about the apps. And the apps have become very, very complicated. When you manage an application, what do you have to do? You have to create or purchase that application. You have to architect it. You have to integrate it, probably with a whole bunch of other stuff that's out there. You have to test it, test it again, again, and again. It turns out also, if it's something like SAP or an ERP package, and I gather you're building one of your own, uh, you have to test it again, 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 and again. Because your organization, your business, is going to depend on it fundamentally for its existence. Then you have to install it, you have to monitor it, you have to manage it, you have to archive it, you have to have a, a business continuity plan. So you back stuff up. The joke is when I talk to customers, you know, you also have to regularly restore it. Did you know that? Having a backup is insufficient. You better know that that backup will actually work when something inevitably goes wrong, because guess what? Things inevitably go wrong. You don't place a bet that, oh, we'll be okay, we'll have an insurance policy, nothing will go wrong. You always end up having to claim on it. So it better be good insurance policy. And then you want to test it for failover. So you build this beautiful thing where you can replicate between site A and site B. And then what happens is in a traditional environment, for example, where I was at eBay and others, they will do tabletop exercise of failover between the data centers, which is totally wonderful um, until you have a real problem. And then what they will do is they'll make a bet that they can bring up site A before they could ever restore site B, unless site A happens to be a smoking hole in the ground. And that happens. Data centers get wiped out, or not wiped out, that they go down regularly. You have the electric company will come in and test the power supply, and at that point they'll take down one of your two circuits in your data center, and then you discover that 20% of your machines had both their power supplies plugged into the same damn circuit, because they were plugged in by human beings who have a 20% chance of messing up. So this is managing these applications is very non-trivial. I actually think it's a very interesting problem to go away and solve. And then for every application that you have, not only do you need to do all of that, you have to have smart people. People who understand the semantics of the application, understand all the dependencies, all the components, how they fit together, what the performance characteristics are, how to tune it. You need processes for managing those life cycles we talked about. Then you need maybe a tools ecosystem that wraps around it with our products, with Oracle databases. It's not just the software that is interesting and locks you in. You've got people with the skills, you've got the processes. You may have pieces of software that back up the database, that back up a VMware environment, that restore it, that add management capabilities, all of that complexity around one application. And then in the real world, when you manage these applications and you deploy them, 
you have to interact with this wonderful thing called a ticketing system. Have any of you, do you have ticketing systems here or do you use Helpzilla or something? No? Well, in the commercial world, it's deep joy. You file a ticket when you want to change. So if I want to deploy a new application, I file a ticket. Then what happens? Well, usually luck. <laughs> because if, you, if you're lucky, you don't need to know who's going to actually implement your ticket. If you're really unlucky, you need to know where their children go to school. Because it's the only way you're going to force them to actually do the thing you want them to do. To deploy a server, to deploy a service, whatever. And when you deploy a service, it's like a lottery. When you deploy a service, you suddenly have to have separate tickets for deploying servers, storage, networking, operating systems, databases, the applications, the application patches, the load balancer policies, the firewall policies. This stuff gets complicated very quickly and it becomes like a ticker tape parade. This is managing applications. How simple can it be, right? You install one of these things on a Mac by saying, click from the App Store, it magically appears and you're done. That's not how it works in the enterprise. It's actually really hard. And then for those tickets, it's like a relay race. You have lots of people doing these tickets. You have the guys in storage and networking and compute. And when they want to deploy a service, they hand over that ticket like a relay race with a baton going between all these teams. The worst thing about it is these teams actually don't even speak the same language. Well, that was about three years ago. I suspect it's significantly more. And so when something goes wrong, the CEO of the company is on the bridge with the engineers. And you can imagine being on the bridge one day. Oh, that sounds like the Enterprise, doesn't it? On the bridge of the Enterprise with Captain Jean-Luc Picard. But you can imagine being on the bridge one day and it's $6,000 a second that's going flush down the toilet. And the guy from storage says, we've got a problem with this server called Kingfisher. And the storage guy says, no, 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 no. It's this thing called Andromeda that's got the problem. It turns out they were talking about the same damn thing because the guys in networking named their, their servers after breweries and the guys in storage named them after astronomical objects. You think that's a joke? It's real and it happens in almost every business because these little silos have their own worldview. They live in their own isolated space and they name them their own things. And this is all about managing an application. The question is how many apps do customers and enterprises actually typically have? The answer for a Wall Street institution like a bank is between three and 5,000 apps by some definition of application, which could be an Excel spreadsheet that can be worth you know, several billion dollars if you have the right formula in it, to you know, hundreds of thousands of cores that are doing market simulations. It can be those and everything in between. A defense contractor, I've seen some with 8,000 applications. I've seen a healthcare provider in the United States who grew inorganically by buying lots of other healthcare providers who also had their own application portfolios and they had 10,000 plus apps. Each of those 10,000 apps has to be purchased, created, architected, integrated, tested, tested, tested again, 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 installed, monitored, managed, archived, have a business continuity plan for it. People who understand them, you get the idea. This is the problem in IT. It is overwhelming complexity. And overwhelming complexity leads to the fact that you don't get anything done. That's been the problem of IT for years and years, yet somehow we make progress. But the real problem for businesses is that IT has become this break and actually prevents them making progress. That has been the problem for years. The question is, how do you simplify this? What is the answer? It is all about simplification. Um, if I look at things, it's complexity that is the problem. Complexity drives fragility, drives cost, makes things very, very static. If you want agility, if you want to be dynamic, you want to create things, you want to innovate, you want to disrupt and deliver stuff, you need simplicity. Certainly, it's the, it's the lesson I took away from my, uh, with me when I left eBay. So why does simplicity matter? We can look at the economics, and I would argue there's a thing called the economics of simplicity. So, this is actually the traditional cost breakdown of delivery of an IT service or services within a business. This has been more or less the same the, pretty much the entirety of my career in technology, which is that unbelievable 30-year thing. 80 to 85% of the cost of service delivery is people and software, not physical infrastructure. And I would argue we have never got economies of scale out of managing IT. 
Never, ever. We get some purchasing power through buying large numbers of servers and getting a discount from HP and IBM and Sun or Oracle or whoever. But we've never really got economies of scale uh, out of IT. And the question is why. The why is all of those apps that I talked about. How can you get economies of scale when all those apps require different people with different skill sets, different tool sets to wrap around them? All of that diversity is the problem. That is the real problem. Now, the place that I've come from and where most of my friends are, and I usually say that the diagram on the left is Gartner and McKinsey, who you may be familiar with. They're very famous companies who spend their time as analysts uh, looking at what's going on in the marketplace. And for the, uh, the diagram to your right, that is, that is my friends at Amazon and Google and eBay and Facebook and everywhere else. And what they're able to do is they have massive simplicity. Instead of having thousands of application patterns that they manage, they have a handful. And when you have a handful of patterns for the application and a handful of patterns for storage, you can automate like crazy. And when you automate like crazy, you can do very interesting things. So in this world of the cloud provider, they're able to deploy tens or hundreds of thousands of new instances of an application every week. Not every lifetime, <laughs> every week. Change is not the way you get to the steady state in the modern data center, it is the steady state. It's actually dynamically unstable. Think about, you know, for those of you with an aeronautical engineering bent, perhaps, fighter planes. They used to be designed to be stable in flight, right? You could take your hands off the joystick, there'd be no computers, the plane would glide. Today, in order to be agile, to be better dogfighting planes, they actually fall out of the sky if they don't have a computer to keep all the stuff in sync. Data centers are turning into that kind of thing. Right? So you keep it simple, you're able to get this enormous ability to automate things, and what you get out of it is you actually flip the cost model through automation, and you end up with 80% of the cost becomes, people, uh, becomes physical infrastructure. And once 80% of your cost is physical infrastructure, you can do very, very interesting uh, things. It turns out that your dominant cost at this point is actually energy. So if you go and look at the data centers of Amazon, Google, Facebook, eBay, and everywhere else, what are they obsessing about? They want computers that have the most efficient power supply money can buy. They will get rid of every unnecessary ASIC off the motherboard of the server. I mean, how many USB ports do you need on a server? The answer is not many. Then what, they, what will they do? They will run their data centers 10 degrees hotter than your manufacturers will recommend. Why? Because it's cheaper to replace a broken server than it is to power and cool it. Right? And then they will put their data centers in interesting locations where energy is cheap. You say, don't you mean green? I mean cheap. Because in the cloud, the most interesting metric is not price performance. It's throughput per kilowatt. That's what you care about. So these are the economics of simplicity. This is what's driving. This is what we see in the cloud. I would also argue that not only does cloud and the cloud economic model deliver simplicity, but in the long run, it should also result in services that are more reliable, higher quality, and more secure. Because these organizations, instead of focusing on thousands of different applications and having the people with the skill sets to monitor, manage, archive them, and all the rest of the stuff, they're focused on two or three applications that differentiate them and only those applications. So even though right now they're not in that place, at some point in the future, and it may not be too far off, I would bet that they will be in that space. So they won't just be the cheapest option, they will be the most reliable and safe and secure option. So if there's the economics of simplicity, then we think about, so how do, how do customers, how do people who run enterprises and do IT take advantage of these economics of simplicity? The first is to actually go to the cloud. So what do we do at VMware? We use 70 SaaS applications, healthcare, payroll, HR, even customer relationship management. We get them as SaaS because we don't, have to, we don't want to buy the software, the hardware. We don't want to have to hire the people who install, monitor, manage, archive it. We don't want any of that burden and overhead of spending time and effort in stuff that doesn't make VMware more successful. We want to spend all our time and money building better software for our customers or investing in research partnerships with academic institutions, doing things that give us a better, brighter future. That's what we want to be doing, that make us more competitive. 
So the opportunity is to go to the cloud. The other thing is for those who can't go to the cloud, and when I said, you know, we only said 70 SaaS applications we consume, and if you say a large, a medium enterprise has, you know, between 90 and 300, a large one in the thousands, there's, you can't put all of those apps out there today because basically you don't trust your data to be out there today. Deciding where apps run isn't about an application, it's actually about the data, because the data is the thing that is regulated and there's compliance about. So for many people, the cloud is still not an option for stuff that really matters to them yet, because it hasn't quite got there in terms of security for certain things. So the question is, how do they get these economics of simplicity? How can they simplify their infrastructure and their apps and everything else and get to this different place where they can actually be more economical, more agile, and everything else? Here's where I get, I guess, technological for a little while, at least-ish. So the first thing you can do is standardize. And this is really, it's actually pretty profound what's happening in modern data centers in an infrastructure perspective. They're becoming extremely homogeneous. Now in the past, what, why do you care about homogeneity? Well, remember I said simplicity is what it's all about. Well, in the past, data centers were very heterogeneous. You had lots of different computers with different instruction set architectures. You had lots of different types of operating systems. You had lots of different types of storage subsystems. And all of that variety is what drives complexity and cost. It's not the number of servers that you manage that drives cost. It's the number of server vendors and the rate at which they change their firmware. It's not the number of operating system instances that drives complexity. It's the number of operating system types and the rate at which you patch them. For storage, it's not the number of petabytes or terabytes of disk that an admin manages that's an interesting metric because basically EMC or Hitachi will double the density of Rust next year and suddenly you've got a big win. No, it's the number of LUNs that you map and remap on a weekly basis. This is the stuff that drives cost and complexity. And that heterogeneity is really hard because the other thing is you can't build and automate the management of it because every time you build a management tool to manage all that diverse environment, one of the vendors goes away and changes their products and breaks you. So at Sun, I was trying to build a thing called N1, which was meant to be the system that was built out of a network, not one that was just attached to it, but it used the network as a backplane, essentially. So if you're going to do that thing, it was a fantastic idea. The trouble is you couldn't build it then. We're building it now because we can, but we couldn't then because of that heterogeneity. So the big thing that's happened is x86. This is a no-brainer, right? x86 has become the de facto deployment platform for clouds and for pretty much all new applications in data centers. x86 is interesting not just because it's the de facto platform for compute. I would also argue very strongly it is the de facto platform for storage. The vast majority of the world's data by capacity is installed in the big data and analytics infrastructures of Facebook, Google, Amazon, eBay, and anyone else who's doing big data and analytics. Hundreds and thousands of petabytes of the stuff, orders of magnitude greater than the stuff that sits in high performance arrays. That doesn't diminish the value of high performance arrays. It's just telling you what the trend is. We're also seeing that x86 is becoming a platform for networking too that we have been able to make the physical infrastructure good enough for the vast majority of infrastructure and applications that we want that we don't need this customized ASICs everywhere. We can do it in software on top of an industry standard server. For networking, we want fast packet forwarding. We don't need to do load balancing firewalls and have all of that accelerated in firmware. The stuff that takes time to rev and to keep up, you can just put it in in software today. This is very, very profound. That data center is becoming much more homogeneous. From a networking perspective, it's also becoming much flatter. The network architectures are changing to, saw, to accommodate network virtualization, as well as big data applications, which have a vast amount of east-west traffic, and lots of internode uh, chatter. So standardization in the network is, in, in the infrastructure is a really big deal. x86 is very, very profound. The second thing that's profound, and you'd expect me to say this, is I come from VMware, is, is virtualization. Now, I sometimes joke, and I, know, I don't know how popular it is here, but I say that working for VMware is like being on Sesame Street. Sesame Street is this children's program, and at the end, they always say, this show was brought to you by the letter. Well, working for VMware is like this show was brought to you by the letter V. We're going to talk about virtualization until you go to sleep, or die, or buy our products, whichever comes first. Right? 
Now, virtualization is very profound. It's very, very interesting. What virtualization allows us to do is to separate the application from the physical infrastructure. Once you separate an application from the physical infrastructure, you can do very interesting things in delivering SLAs. You can move it from low capacity to high capacity, and you can do it without stopping the application. It's a thing called vMotion. You can also move it from a machine that's breaking to one that is not breaking, from one that needs maintenance to one that does not need maintenance. Once you encapsulate an application in a virtual machine, you can replicate it across sites to give you business continuity, and you can push it out to the cloud and pull it back in from the cloud. This mobility and this separation of the application from physical infrastructure confers all sorts of benefits, which businesses think of as cost savings, because you can consolidate, or agility, because you can just spin up services really quickly. In fact, virtualization in the VM is the thing that gives you the instant provisioning of cloud. We can spin up a VM in 30 seconds. This is very profound. For me, it's very much like containerization and what it did to the shipping industry. You get those same benefits of flexibility once you decouple. In the past, in shipping, what would happen? You'd have a factory somewhere. You would have produce. You'd have to box it in lots of different sized boxes. You'd put them into a back of a truck or a horse and cart. And you'd play a game of 3D Tetris to try and optimize and get everything to fill all the space possible. Then you'd drive it all the way to a port. You'd do the same game of 3D Tetris by putting all the packages onto a, uh, onto a ship. And then at the other end, you'd do the game all over again to put them on a railway track. Today, what you do, you put them into a container. It's either 20 foot or 40 foot. You can ship it anywhere in the world. All the ports, all the railway heads, everywhere knows how to deal with a container. You've got mobility and agility and standardization. This is what we're doing with the applications. And it's very profound because the hard problem with managing applications isn't how you manage one application. It's how you manage 3,000. You can't possibly write automation software that will manage every one of your 3,000 applications because you can't understand the semantics of all those 3,000. It's just not scalable. Well, the interesting thing is if you put it into a container, you can manage the container as a proxy for managing the application. You can change its size and thus change the performance of the application that's in it. You can replicate it and thus replicate the application that's in it. Containerizing the application is what really, really matters. Once you've got the app in that container, by automating the life of the container, you automate the life of all the applications you could ever possibly put in that container. That's VMware's enormous opportunity. And now we can do that thing we talked about. We can automate. We can automate like crazy. And that gives us all those benefits that we talked about, about simplicity. It gives us agility. It gives us flexibility. It ultimately gives us economies of specialization. Hopefully that makes sense, right? So for VMware, when we're looking at what we want to do with applications, it really breaks down into a couple of areas. We talked about virtualize, separate the application from infrastructure, from compute, network, and storage, and then automate like crazy. Now what I'm talking about here is very high level stuff. And so from our customers' perspective, when I talk to them, it's they're interested in, you know, what does this mean to my business? And I'll talk about that in a minute, why it's really important to them. When I'm talking to you, why do I think it's interesting for you know, collaborative research and, and things like that? Well, virtualization of compute isn't finished, but we've come quite a long way away along on it. But we do want to get all of the applications that could possibly run on x86 to run on these things. People think of Windows and SharePoint and email and OLTP databases. I think there's a number where I think today it's something like 85% of all instances of applications that run on x86 run inside a VM. But only 20 to 25% of all the x86 servers have a hypervisor on them, which tells us there's a lot of servers running a very small number of very large applications. Think grid, think big data, and everything else. We have to get those apps to run really well on a hypervisor. What does that mean? We want to do network and storage function virtualization as well uh, to, to do that. So we really need to do that network side of things. So how do we do that? We need people to go away and do research. We need research in terms of how we make hypervisors jitter-free and very low latency and to, to the point where there is zero delta between them and physical hardware, more or less. It turns out that almost everything is under 5% at this point in time. And actually some things, surprisingly, some HPC loads and some big data loads are actually, you get higher throughput 
on a virtual environment than a straight physical one, which is completely counterintuitive. We need help in what's going on with networking. We've got software defined going on here, which I haven't really talked enough about. Right? There's a software defined data center uh, that we're creating. So as we separate and virtualize and separate the application from the underlying physical infrastructure, we spent 15 years as a company separating it from the x86 server. And we brought virtual networking and compute into the hypervisor to some greater or lesser degree. Right? And so with those virtual machines on the hypervisor, you can now spin up your apps and your operating systems really quickly. That's the instant provisioning of cloud. The trouble is most of your applications are not singletons. <laughs> they don't run in a single instance of an operating system. They're network distributed. So the fact that we could spin up a VM in 30 seconds or a minute or two, but then it can take, then we've got to do what else? What have we got to do? Firewall policies, load balancer policies. We might have to re-IP the entire application. Then we've got to do the magic, because networking is magic, right? You do know that. So you look down your sleeve and say, is there a network down here? Is there one around here? Oh, there's a VLAN. And so what should take seconds and minutes turns into hours, days, and weeks, depending on that ticket storm that I talked about at the beginning. And so all that agility disappears. So what we as a company did about a year and a half ago is we bought a small startup, 100 people, um, a company called Nasira. Uh, we spent $1.26 billion on these 100 people. So even though... You know, the VCs had a decent chunk in the businesses. The founders did pretty well, that's my guess. And what do they allow us to do? In the same way that the VM is the container for the compute side, they allow us to create a virtual network, a network container for a network distributed application. So that when you put an application inside this network distributed container and you give it virtual network, virtual uh, firewalling and load balancers and routing, you don't have to change that thing as you move it and compress it and stretch it. You don't have to reconfigure any of it. You just leave it as it is. And you get all those benefits of mobility and flexibility um, and the ability to consolidate. So this is really important and interesting stuff. Right? We also see it happening with storage. We're spending money on companies that separate the application from the underlying storage infrastructure and then we are able to present the storage in a way that the application cares about, irrespective of how that storage is actually implemented, whether it's SAN, whether it's NAS, whether it's iSCSI, doesn't matter. The application consumer doesn't want to care about the underlying topology, right? They just want to be able to get at their data with the right performance attributes, scale attributes, and availability attributes. This is the thing that we call the software-defined data center. You should be seeing lots of stuff about software-defined data centers. Software-defined everything. Unfortunately, I, I, there's a server vendor out there that talked about the software-defined server. So for me, that felt just a little bit too much like a dichotomy that my brain couldn't quite assimilate. Um, but nonetheless, the data center is turning into this software-defined thing. So as we separate the apps from the underlying physical infrastructure, we virtualize compute, network, and storage, we can now automate like crazy. Does this thing sound familiar to you guys? This sounds like an operating system, right? What does an operating system do? It maps workload onto resource in line with policies. The traditional OS maps threads and processes onto CPU memory and I.O. based on scheduling classes, fair shares, nice values, whatever the heck it is, right? That's what it does. In this world, we're talking about mapping business applications, distributed apps, onto cloud infrastructure to deliver the right SLA at the right price, flexibly, safely, securely, and compliant. We're building what I would argue is a meta operating system. It's not a Windows that goes across your data center. It's not a Linux that goes across your data center. It's a layer of software that goes across your hardware and presents containers, VMs, network containers, for traditional operating systems. And those traditional operating systems have become something else in the last five years. They become a runtime environment for a single application instance. All that work that people like me spent uh, 15 years ago on Solaris containers, making a single OS instance the, the place to share multiple apps is actually not the future in many ways. It's become the VM has become the default environment and the operating system has just become a runtime environment typically for a single instance of an application. So this software-defined data center, this is where the world is going. Um, there's lots of opportunities for research here and collaboration. There's you know, when you think about an app, what is an application? 
an application is like a graph of dependencies and constraints, right? There's all of these components, and I have a policy associated with them. How do I map them onto this infrastructure to get the optimal mapping for performance and scale and other business attributes? That stuff's not trivial, right? If I think about the description of an application, I would make a very strong case, I believe, that we as an industry have had an obsession for the last 30 years of thinking about managing the nodes on that graph, the servers, the operating systems, uh, the network switches, the storage devices. Yet philosophically, when I look at distributed systems, the thing that delivers value isn't the sets of components, it's how we wire them together, it's the relationships. Shouldn't we be thinking about what a relationship-based system would look like? Instead of managing the endpoints, how about we manage the relationships? The relationships that express or make real performance scale availability and everything else. These are interesting things we need to know and understand. One of the areas I think is also ripe for collaboration is how we build these systems and how they work starts looking a lot like human systems. I'm interested in collaborating with organizational psychologists and anthropologists. Why? Because these systems have to integrate with human systems. So shouldn't we understand how human systems behave so that we can build something that integrates with them? Secondly, human systems have been building, have been creating, well, we, we have been creating human systems for the best part of 7,000 years that are scale, that scale, that are resilient, uh, that have delegation of authority and policy and that comes down into implementation. In fact, human systems have all of the same attributes we care about with distributed software systems. Seems like there'll be some opportunities there. And the reason I think that interdisciplinary stuff is really important is there's so much data to show that it is interdisciplinary work and people working together from different backgrounds, different experiences, different domain expertise that actually drives innovation more than almost anything else. Your biggest enemy of innovation is a monoculture. If you want to do something exciting, and you want to go into that lab that I saw this morning, which, I, which impressed the hell out of me, right? I thought it was really fantastic. It was so nice seeing robots being built, all of that stuff. It's really cool. But if you want to maximize your opportunity of coming up with a really weird and wacky idea, do it with people who come from a different background, have a slightly different view on the problem, want to solve, you know, come with a different set of experiences, and then riff off each other. Okay, I think that's enough for that lecture part. Yeah? But, but you get the idea. I'm, one, I'm pretty passionate about this. Two, I think we're not done. I think there's a vast amount of really interesting stuff uh, to do in this space and, and for people to make a difference. So that's the software-defined data center. So for us, we believe this software-defined data center will ultimately be more simple. When I talk about that layer of software as a meta operating system, think of it the same way that you have iOS on an iPhone. An iPhone is infinitely complex. You couldn't possibly imagine how to build one of these things. This is really hard, right? But you can consume all of its value very easily because the interface is so damn simple. Guess what? We have to do the same thing with compute infrastructure. It has to be stupidly simple. And this layer of software is about doing that. Once we've done that, we can give them choice. What do I mean by that? Well, it turns out that customers in the world want to live in a world that's essentially hybrid. So all of you have heard about cloud, no doubt, and I'll talk a little bit about cloud uh, in, in a few minutes. But the world, everyone wants to take advantage of this stuff. But if I'm a CIO and I go and look at a public cloud like Google and Amazon, I can't do a sniff test, I go, Ugh. it doesn't look anything like the infrastructure I have inside. The apps don't behave the same way. They're not written the same way. I probably need different people with different skills and different tools to go away and manage it. And I probably need different processes. As a CIO and a businessman, you look at it and it says, oh, that's risk, that's cost, and that's time, none of which are particularly good. What they want is a public cloud infrastructure that looks like their private cloud infrastructure. So for VMware, we sit there and go, we're going to build a hybrid cloud that looks, smells, and feels like a customer's private cloud. Now, that's our strategy. But the thing that's profound about this is what we're really seeing is that businesses in the future will not be just wholly private or they won't be 100% public cloud. They're going to span both of those things. There are times when they're going to want stuff private, maybe because of data concerns or other things, and compliance. And there's times when they really don't want to own stuff. In fact, the vast majority of businesses are not differentiated through the ownership of physical infrastructure. They don't want to be in the business of managing servers and storage and networking and everything else. They want to pay people like us and you to build the software and the tools that hide all that complexity for them. 
Once you do that, you can innovate. You separate the abstract from the infrastructure. You get out of the business of managing damned infrastructure. You either pay someone else to do it, or you have software that does it for you. And then you get a choice about where you run. So you can get out of the business of having to actually have physical infrastructure. Because honestly, it's, am I saying this? It's not that interesting, <laughs> except for people like me, and maybe some of you. And innovation is what it's all about. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's going on right now that is, that is pretty scary to the vast majority of businesses out there. So let's talk a little bit about cloud. So I stood on stage about eight years ago at a conference in San Francisco, uh, immediately following Werner Fogels. Does anyone know who he is? Come on, you must do, right? I'm, everyone's, you're not nodding, but I know you do know him. So he's the CTO of Amazon, and he was launching AWS. And he went on stage, he had half an hour, and then I had half an hour immediately following him on behalf of eBay. And everyone's saying, Paul, are you about to announce eBay web services for the rest of the world? To which the answer was no. But I stood on stage and I was giving a kind of academic sort of, this cloud stuff, it's a Jedi mind trick, right? It's kind of like hype. But it's not. But what I couldn't see was why it was so different. Because I'd been working, and this virtual, virtualization and grid and utility computing had been going on for a while. These trends were not new. Why did I really care about them? Turns out I was completely mistaken. It, I was looking through all of this through the eyes of a technologist. So this is another warning I have for you and why it's so important to understand the use cases and what people want to do with technology, because you risk being sideswiped. So I looked at it and I said, this is nothing new technologically. There's no big technology thing here. And I think I was more or less right, but what I missed was the real point. Cloud is actually about a consumption model for IT. And that consumption model is genuinely disruptive, fundamentally disruptive to everything that we've ever done. The notion of self-service, instantly provisioned, pay for what you use, elastic and cost-efficient IT is something we have never, ever had before. What we used to have to do was buy software, buy the hardware to run it on, buy the people to do the installation, and buy the people who would monitor and manage it and archive it and everything else, or sign some long upfront contract and get someone else to do it for us. And we couldn't differentiate between the software and IT that made us a more successful and competitive company and the stuff that did not. Now with cloud, I would argue four things have fundamentally changed. First is we can get business transformation because organizations can commoditize the IT that doesn't differentiate them and invest in new IT that does. The second area is it completely changes the rate of innovation because the technology or the acquisition of technology is no longer a barrier to entry to marketplaces. You can buy it with a credit card. The mere existence of these cloud providers has changed the game inside businesses because guess what? For years it was speak to the hand, change is risk. But now lines of business can go out there with a credit card and a mouse and get IT. And then the technology that makes it real, virtualization, is changing the way people manage infrastructure. So for me, when I think about cloud, it is truly profound what is going on with cloud. There's always been hype about it, but I don't think, it is un I don't think it's really hyperbole. I actually think the future is a very different place because of this one thing. It's very, very profound. And I'm, I know I'm running out of time, but I'm still probably going to go on a little while. You can tell me when to stop. So this is very, very profound. So let, let's have a look at one thing. So one of the things I say it does is it democratizes innovation. So you can imagine, you could be sat on a sofa somewhere, uh, much more handsome than I am, which is very depressing, but there you go, I'm an old bugger. You can be sat on a, a sofa somewhere, and with a bit of luck, you have a good idea, right? What happens with that good idea? In, in, in America, you can now go online, you can regis register yourself as a Delaware-based corporation to save money, get tax benefits. You can then source all your back office applications as SaaS. You can go to Alibaba.com in China and get physical goods manufactured for you that you then sell on Amazon and eBay and drop ship, ship via FedEx, UPS, and DHL. And by the way, you haven't left your sofa. So in the same way the internet provided organizations with global access to markets to sell their goods and services, the cloud is providing organizations with global access to IT resources from which they can build businesses technology ceases to be this barrier to entry to marketplaces. It's driving change and making change faster and faster and faster. This is, really, this is why I said you live in a very exciting time. Because once you start getting into this world, all bets are off. Right? You're only limited by your imagination and your will to go and do something. You don't need to raise a whole load of capital to buy physical hardware, which was one of the most expensive things you could do. 
So not only do you get that, I would argue that the rate of innovation changes things. So the academic inside me, it's about as academic as I get, tells me that failure is the currency with which we acquire knowledge. You don't acquire knowledge by getting something right the first time. You acquire it by learning how not to screw it up. So you mess it up a few times and you learn how not to mess it up in the future, i.e. you get it right. And what cloud provides us with is this opportunity where to try something takes less time, costs less money, and takes less risk. So it speeds up innovation. You can try 10 times the number of ideas in one tenth of the time at a tenth of the cost and the risk. And so we see things, innovation, moving faster and faster and quicker and quicker and quicker. So if you're not nimble, it's a Darwinian thing, right? It's the agile that survives. It's not the fittest. That's a big misquote. It's the agile, the adaptable. So let's look at what this stuff is doing to traditional businesses and why it really matters. So I th you guys are familiar with the Encyclopedia. There are some places in the world I go where they don't know the Encyclopedia Britannica. But I'm proud that you do. And of course, I come from England. And so for me, you know, this is something that's a wonderful, venerable thing. The way they sell it is a salesman comes around to your house and says, here, a wonderful collection, an encyclopedia, beautiful leather bound. You can smell it, right? It's fantastic. You put it on a shelf. You have yearly updates. You feel smart. You look smart. And you'll confer smartness upon your children. It'll be an heirloom for decades to come. So in 1990, they had a $600 million a year business. Uh, by 1995, these guys were busy munching away on their lunch. And their revenues were down to $325 million a year. Any guesses what happened next? So, 600 million users. And I didn't say readers. I said users. 600 million potential contributors. Wikipedia has completely destroyed both Encarta's and the Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Britannica's business models. If you want to watch something interesting, I watched the election of the last pope, so the current pope. And you started off with this tiny little paragraph about this cardinal in Argentina. It turned into a rant about Catholic priests wearing frocks and doing nasty things to young boys and collaborating with military dictatorships in Argentina. But after about three or four hours, you got a fairly good article. I wouldn't call it academically rigorous, but you know what? It was good enough. Oh, and it was in 100 languages. And you didn't have to wait a year for your update to arrive for the Encyclopedia Britannica. And indeed, 2012 was the last year you could buy a brand new physical Encyclopedia Britannica. They're the family heirloom they always said they would be. So this is three business models in 20 years. Let's talk about three in 10. Anyone know these guys? Renting out videos, video tapes. Do you remember what they were? Probably not. My kids don't. Lucky. They used to stretch. It was horrible. Yeah, just don't even go there. But Blockbuster, when I moved to the United States in 1999, they were growing about 15% year on year. Uh, extraordinarily successful. There's one of these on every shop corner. The only reason I go into one today, if I can find one in the lower 48 states of the United States, is to go and buy a cheap second-hand Blu-ray because they're going out of business. The trouble is they're already gone. I have to go to Canada or Europe to find one, and I'm not doing that. I, I, I like my films, but not that much. What happened to these guys? These guys did. What did they do? They offered a you know, you could queue up your DVDs that you wanted to watch. You watched one, you returned it, they would send you the next one. They wouldn't charge you late fees. It was all just very, very convenient. And Netflix at the time, at one point, were offering both physical goods distribution and DVD and streaming for the same single price. They recognized the oncoming tsunami that's these guys. And so they bifurcated their own business into separate streaming and physical goods. Got out of the business, effectively, in the long run, they said they're going to effectively let the physical goods and logistics business die and just focus on streaming. And so they ate their own lunch before iTunes could eat it for them. That is the modern world. This is three business models in 10 years. And actually, that's not even the half of it. What's happened to iTunes, to Netflix, is they're now in the business of content creation. So what did they do? They, the first series they introduced was called House of Cards, based on originally on a British television series and a book before it. And because they were intimate with their customers through big data in a way that satellite broadcasters and terrestrial broadcasters could never be, they knew every user and what they did. 
They understood that the large numbers of viewers preferred to watch serials as a marathon at a weekend rather than to wait every week. I'm not joking. And so what did they do with House of Cards? They released the entire series at one instant so that people could watch the marathon from the get-go. These people are using technology as a weapon of mass disruption. It's not about automating the way you've always done things. It's about doing things differently. This is why it really matters for your generation. This is not about iterative optimization. It's about doing things differently. That's the opportunity the young have because you tend to see the world differently from those of us who've been doing this for 30 years and sit there and go, oh, I can apply this technology and optimize this thing that I always wanted to optimize. When I was your age, I was thinking about the video games you can buy now on PS4, but I wanted them in 1980. It was a bit difficult in 1980 to get decent video games. We had Pong, for those of you who remember it, or Pac-Man. Defender was my favorite. You, might, you can buy that on phones these days, I think, if memory serves me correctly. But this is what we really mean. When we talk about technology changing things, this is what's happening. And the technology I talked about with software-defined data centers, these are the underpinnings that enable all of this to happen. Cloud, software-defined data centers, they make this stuff real. These aren't just intellectually stimulating exercises. They're changing the way people live their lives, the way they consume media, the way they interact with each other. This is stupidly exciting. <laughs> it's just amazing. So what do, what do people do? What do businesses do? They transform their applications. They think differently about the apps. The apps have fundamentally shifted from, you know, in the world where I grew up, you used to have monolithic applications on mainframes. Then we had client server, three tier, n tier. Now we have highly distributed and disaggregated apps, and we federate them together. It's really changed. And actually, I'd argue that evolution of the app has gone hand in hand with the evolution of physical infrastructure. Monolithic apps on monolithic boxes connected together with thin, wet string, right? Then we, had we got cheap cycles on the desktop, so we built client server, we, we, we built apps on the desktop. We got the corporate LAN, we did client server apps, we did file and print sharing. We discovered that we didn't like managing the client. So we went web-based and had stateless clients. Then we discovered the client didn't have a reliable connection back to base because it was wireless and hell, there's a lot of compute power on that phone, more than went up on the original Apollo missions and probably the early shuttles too. And so we built mobile cloud applications. Actually, they feel like client-server, but they're actually not, because the client is a fundamentally different beast. We don't manage it, we treat it as a cache, we overwrite it, and then we gather lots of data and information from that client and feed it back into the cloud. Geospatial information, video, audio, other things, right? Accelerometers, you name it. All those sensors feed stuff back into the cloud. So the applications are fundamentally shifting, and what we're seeing is the nature of the app is changing. Everyone must be familiar with this, right? It's got three layers. I always thought seven layers was the magic number. How can three be really magic? But seven layers is a good one. We'll, we'll let it go, though. So in the past, what were these? There was a kind of stateless client, there was business logic, and there was no LTP database. Everything was put into an OLTP database because we thought we knew how to make it scale and make it reliable, and let's not worry about that. Let's just throw data into it, and away we go. The world is changing. Those apps are fundamentally different going forward. Right? The first thing is the client your phone. So more than 50% of all new applications today are written to run natively on iOS or Android. Not Windows, not OS X, not Linux, Android and iOS, and natively. At some point it will transition to HTML5, but that is the point of consumption. 2013 was the first year where the total install base of smart devices, phones and tablets, overtook the total install base of PCs and laptops. They are the past, in the same way that the mainframe is the past, i.e. they won't disappear for a very long time, but they're not going to be the place where all the innovation tends to happen. It's going to happen on these other devices. And these other devices offer very, very different consumption experiences. Uh, it's very, very different. And the app itself is different, too. The middle tier, I would argue, is going to, and it's, an, it's a concept I'm not entirely comfortable with yet, but I get a sense there's going to be business process mashup. The software, as you disaggregate it, you're disaggregating the business processes it makes real, and you can start mashing it up and reordering things. And in fact, we are beginning to see that. And I think we'll see mashup for business process in the same way we see mashup for audio and video. And then finally, the OLTP database has turned into real-time streaming analytics. So just to give you a sense of how insane all of that is, I'll give you some numbers from when I was at eBay. They're three years out of date. They're also in the public domain because I put them there. 
for eBay. So it's kind of safe. They're out of date, but it's interesting. We had 280 million customers when I left. 250 million items uh, in auction at any given point in time. We did something like, we did more transactions per day than NASDAQ and the New, St New York Stock Exchange combined by some measure. You know there's lies, damn lies, and statistics, right? We did 50 billion SQL calls to the back-end databases a day. And those are the ones that missed the cash. So maybe about 5%. We had 650 production database instances in 120 clusters. And four petabytes of rotating rust at the back end. The biggest, meanest, fastest arrays money could buy. By the time I left, the analytics infrastructure was three times as big. And I thought it was doubling every year. I was wrong. So not specifically about eBay, but in the web space, we are seeing organizations today where the analytics infrastructures are growing an order of magnitude every year to two years. So they're building out today three, four, five hundred petabyte analytics infrastructures. This is insane. Why are they doing this? Because they want to monetize every single interaction in real time and maximize their value. So if I'm at eBay and I want to find something and I search and I can't find it, they want to offer me something else I might like to buy, like an accessory for something I bought in the past. Or they'll offer me something that someone else who bought what I bought in the past went on to buy. Or they know that last year I bought something for someone whose birthday it was, and they'll recommend something, an accessory for something that person has bought because they know it's their birthday. If I swipe a credit card, I have 30 seconds to run as many fraud algorithms as possible to determine whether it's a fraudulent transaction. The more algorithms I run, the safer and lower the risk of fraud, the more profitable the interaction is. All of this stuff is about differentiating the business. The notion of batch and transaction doesn't exist anymore. It's a merger of the two. If you're doing a trade on Wall Street, you want to run as many algorithms to figure out whether it's like a game of chess. The more moves ahead you can look, the better. And this is all about being intimate with your environment. This is all this big data and analytics. And I think of it as being very closely aligned, actually, even to high-performance computing and simulation. Because businesses are focusing in this new world on how do you differentiate yourself in the marketplace. It's through intimacy. Intimacy with your physical environment, your customers, whatever. And intimacy in intimate with the past, intimate with the present, real-time streaming analytics, and intimate with the future, simulation and high-performance computing. You think about car, car crashes, yeah? 15 years ago, it's, can I simulate a car crash? Five years ago, it's, hmm, do I need to crash a car anymore? Now it's, how many simulations do I run to make my car the safest in the marketplace? I can't get enough cycles for that, right? Go up to the cloud, do whatever. So the apps are fundamentally shifting and changing. Very, very exciting stuff going on. Once you transform the apps, you can transform the business. So we talked a little bit about Netflix. Uh, but what we're seeing happening, and I said, you know, IT you should view as a, a weapon of mass disruption, not a way of optimizing the way we've always done things. So when we think about how we do things today, let's look at the, at the old use cases here. So firstly, there's labor automation. Let us automate repetitive activity to make it reliable, because people have a 20% chance of screwing up, pretty much. It doesn't matter how diligent people are. They make mistakes because we're human beings and we don't run on a deterministic engine where the output is always the same no matter what the input is. That is not who we are. Those of you doing mechanical engineering, you may be able to build some of those things, but even those have interesting and unique failure modes. <laughs> then once you've automated something, you can increase productivity by increasing the rate of iteration. And we can do non-human scale computing. I always wondered what the hell is this human scale computing thing, by the way? It turns out that she was my wife's aunt. So she used to work for GCHQ in England, and her job was cryptography. She was a mathematician, and on her business card, if she'd had one, and then she wouldn't have had to shoot you if she'd shown it to you, she was a computer. Today, the use cases are different. They're business model transformation. How do I do the Netflix thing? How do I do the Wikipedia thing? How do I make the whole greater than the sum of the parts in the business that I'm working in? This is the social enterprise. I'm in a band, as it happens. You can probably, I've got long hair. I must be in a band, right? So it turns out I'm in a band. Or if you happen to be in a sports team, you have the classic example of how the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. 
You can do things that individuals can never do. You can do it at a scale. You can do it in a way that it can't be done any other way. How do we make companies work that way? Because guess what? The vast majority of them do not. They're actually horribly inefficient at getting stuff done. And again, when I talked about innovation, about getting a mix of people with different backgrounds, that's what you want to happen inside your enterprise. And then finally, we end up with organizations and businesses that are data-based. They don't use a database. They have data and self-learning algorithms that modify the business processes in real time. That's the Google AdWords kind of world. It's pretty scary. That's the world of arbitrage algorithms on Wall Street, where you get millisecond or microsecond crashes where you lose 20% of all the market value, and it comes back in less than a second. And you sit there and say, huh? The scary thing there is computers make decisions. These algorithms make decisions in the nanosecond space, and human beings make them in tenths of a second. And even if you slow it down to the human way of doing things, it would take you years to go through all the damn steps and work out what went wrong wrong. So you end up with these death spirals of these monocultures of arbitrage algorithms. I hope I'm not scaring you there, but there you go. <laughs> There's good and bad to all this stuff. And if we want to look at the canonical example of new, this impact of new IT, um, I'll refer to those guys north of us who I referred to earlier, uh, and Werner's little mob up in uh, uh, Seattle. Now, I think they're pretty insidious about a bunch of things they do, but you've got to sit there and say, over the last 10 years, they've fundamentally changed two marketplaces in a way that is completely and utterly irreversible. So in terms of um, building stuff, what have they done? They've changed the cost of inputs. Their warehouses, their warehouses are completely unique and interesting, right? They treat them the way, they spread load across them the way we spread load across disks in database systems. We want to randomize all the accesses so we don't have hotspotting. So they distribute their stuff across the warehouse randomly, <laughs> or semi-randomly, rather than having all the PS4s in one shelf. That's kind of interesting. They're in the business of selling high volume, low margin product. So it was all about logistics for them originally. Then they eliminate value chain intermediaries. So you don't need book binders anymore. You don't need warehouses for them because you print on demand or you send them off to a Kindle. Um, they actually now, you don't need a publishing contract with Random House to publish a book. You can self publish on Amazon. They've democratized publishing. You may need that deal with Random House to sell a million copies, but you don't need it to get read. Then they go away and introduce a new monetization model for their existing infrastructure. It's that classic one that pharmaceutical industry is always looking for, where they had this wonderful innovation 20 years ago, and now they can find another application of it and renew their patent. <laughs> but this is absolutely brilliant, right? When I talk to customers today, the vast majority of customers are not having a conversation about which server vendor they want to go to. They're having a conversation about whether they want to bother buying a server. You can't imagine that conversation 10 years ago. It's insane. They drive customer preference through using big data. Think about Amazon Prime. They will do fixed price shipping because they know who buys their products, where they live, how much they weigh, how large they are, and what they buy. So they can sit there and amortize it across every single damn product they've got. The worst thing about this is that Amazon, my wife hates them. She's jealous because they know me better than she does. So I buy music from Amazon without listening to it. I've been a customer of theirs for 15 years. I buy CDs because I still buy physical media because I know what my legal rights are with regards to ownership of content. <laughs> and I'm a sad old geek when it comes to that kind of thing. But I buy the stuff without ever listening to it first and I'm very rarely disappointed. And that's all their big data. They know me and they know people like me all over the world. The worst thing about it is, because of that, I buy three times as much as I should. And so I ship it to work so my wife can't find out. And that's why she hates them. She comes home and finds an $800 thing sat there and says, where did that come from, Paul? Oh, Amazon, darling. Oh, thank you, Paul. Oh, let's not go there. <laughs> And then they serve underserved markets. You think about books, second-hand books. If you're going to go to there to buy a book, you might as well buy all your books there. In the G20 countries, and I'm not, I, I suspect it's not quite the same here in India yet, but if you go across the United States or most of the places in Europe, you go to a shopping center or a shopping mall, you will not find a national chain who deal exclusively in media, in print media, audio, or video. They're all gone. They are dead. There are niche providers. But they've all gone, and every company is sitting there going, how do I do omnichannel? What is the purpose of having a physical shop? Now, I can imagine it. If you're into clothes, you want to try them on. But maybe the purpose of the shop is to try on clothes, not to sell them to you. They're just a broker for the online retailers. 
It's all changing. IT has changed. We're talking about this cloud thing all the damn time. It's not hype. It's real. It's changed the world we live in in a way that is utterly remarkable. And so there's been a reset. Not a, you know, these cloud providers exist. And so what's happening in enterprises and business is that expectations have been reset. There's no going back. The notion of slow IT, where it takes glacial change. You know, it's nine months to get a rack of servers, nine months to get a petabyte of disk, and nine months to have a baby. Not anymore. I've got to swipe a credit card and press on a mouse, and I get IT. I get software infrastructure and platform as a service. There's no going back. And this is what drives private cloud. It's not, oh, I want to virtualize. It's, I want self-service, in supervision, pay for what I use, cost-efficient, and elastic IT. That is what I want. So everything has changed. Expectations have changed. And for me, all of this is a perfect storm. I'll bypass this boring slide, because it just has a cloud word cloud on it. But it's a perfect storm. So in the, I talked about cloud and then, and how I said, this is not the hyperbole you're looking for. I was both right and I was wrong. From a technology perspective, it wasn't an inflection point in terms of new technology, but it was in the sense of the universal pervasive adoption of certain technologies, virtualization being key, but not the only one, has actually enabled a fundamentally new business model, which is totally disruptive. It's changing everything. And when you combine that with a couple of other things, particularly consumerization, it gets pretty scary. Why are these devices interesting? So I, an iPad for me isn't about easier access to email. So as I said, I'm a musician. Well, no, I'm lying. I play drums. And I record albums for my band. And you can buy my band's albums on iTunes and Amazon. And we're very geeky and nerdy, and it's very complicated. And it used to cost millions of dollars to go into the studio to do this stuff. All this equipment and everything. And now I can do it on my laptop. I can do 64 channels of concurrent audio into my MacBook. It's insane. The trouble is mixing it takes forever, right? I have a guitarist who insists on 40 channels of guitar. For those of you familiar with Saturday Night Live in the United States, there's a, a sketch called More Cowbell. Uh, but the point is I spend forever with my little mouse moving these mixers up and down. Or I can spend $2,300 and I can buy a 40-channel fully digital mixer with motorized sliders and the whole deal. And just a year before, that would have cost me 12,000 bucks. Just 12 months before. Or I can buy a $10 iPad application and turn it into an eight-channel digital mixer and use all my fingers and get all those productivity improvements. Imagine having a, a phone with a 3D camera. Oh, guess what? We do. So what happens? You have an earthquake, you have a storm, you have flooding, there's a crack in a bridge. You send an engineer out, they take a photograph of the crack in the bridge. Because it's three-dimensional, it's quantitative. You know how big the crack in the bridge is. You've got the geospatial coordinates on the phone, and you have a photograph of the crack. In fact, you don't need to send an engineer out. Members of the public can do it for you. These things are changing the way we interact with software systems. This is what, when you start thinking about this thing, the only thing you're constrained with here is your imagination of the stuff that you can do with this. I'm an old guy, and I can think of this stuff. You should be able to do amazing stuff. And then expectation is fundamentally changing. All of this stuff. So if we look, what do I mean by that? Cloud is a manifestation of consumer behavior. It's instant gratification. The services I want, when I want them, pay for what I use, and throw them away when I'm done. Now, the last bit isn't quite as easy, but that is what it's about. It's about consumer behavior and expectation. And when I talk to a CIO, they'll sit there and say to me, and say, oh, these students, when they graduate and they come into my business, you know what, they'll become just like me. And I say to them, tell me, when you started work 30 years ago, what was your CIO like? Are you anything like him? No. So when you guys, and some of you will end up as CIOs, There'll be nothing, there'll be nothing like the world we have now, at all. It's my device anytime, any place. I've been using Macs since 1984. Shouldn't I just use one at work because I'm more productive on it because I've been using it for 30 years? And people come and go from jobs. Why do companies buy people devices? It's stupid. And then the whole interaction model is changing, this whole social model. So for me, the canonical example of this is my own family. So I have four daughters. 
In some parts of the world, that would become very expensive in terms of dowries or whatever. Um, but I have four daughters. My youngest one is four years of age. Any, any guesses what she does with a device? She does this. She's been doing that since the age of three. I gave her an iPad and she started doing that. And she knows exactly, it's so intuitive. Um, it's quite funny, if, I, I heard of a friend of mine who was telling me about, he, he went into a home not that long ago and they had a beautiful 70 inch widescreen television with fingerprints all the way along the bottom where the kids have been trying to <laughs> get the TV to go on. And if you look at YouTube, you can see kids doing it with cardboard books and getting really angry because it doesn't work the way their iPad works. My, seven, my nine year old daughter has been printing coloring book pages off the internet since she was four years old. She learned how to print them without any help. No help at all from an adult. She figured it out at four years of age. My 22 year old daughter, and in case any of you were wondering, that would be family 1.0, and the upgrade was very expensive. It was a rip and replace. <laughs> Hopefully none of you will have these experiences, <laughs> but those of us of a slightly older disposition might relate to these. My 22-year-old is a geneticist, and I don't understand anything she says, right? She's doing a PhD in genetics, and then she's going to be doing an MD. She still thinks her daddy is smart, but I don't understand anything when she starts talking to me about genes expressing proteins here, there, and everywhere. And it's just like, yeah, whatever. But she's going to cure me and make me healthy, so that's good. But my 21-year-old, I'm betting, is pretty much like most of you in the audience. She never, ever reads email. She never writes email, no matter how much I try to nag her. She does everything on a social networking site, and she does it all via messaging, and she does it on a mobile device. The only reason she has a laptop is because she's at university, and in England, if you're dyslexic, which she is, they will buy you a MacBook. That is the workforce of the future. So when we bring it all together and we see what's going on, the big question for business and IT is, how do they take advantage of all of this safely, securely? How do they ride this wave? You've got this torrent, this wave of innovation and change. And the question is, how do I, you either surf it or you get drowned by it. And for us at VMware, our goal is to enable our customers to surf and to ride that wave, to provide them with the software and services that allow them to participate in this. Because us old fuddy-duddies can't sit there and say, speak to the hand, you know, change is not going to happen on my watch, da 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 bang, you get knocked over, you're done. We've got to make it, we've got to facilitate it, we've got to allow people to take advantage of all of that change. And that's the purpose for VMware. And, and so for us, I'd, I'd break it down what we're looking at and the way we see the world. It is all about the applications. It's the applications that make all of this real. And for us, in the areas we think about from a technology perspective, if you're thinking about, you know, if you want to participate with us when we think about our relationships and where we're going and the interning and whatever going forward, it's about the software-defined data center. How do we build that layer of software, that meta-operating system to manage the applications and deliver the right SLA at the right price, flexibly, safely, securely, compliant? Building these distributed operating systems is non-trivial. It is hard, especially to do it in a general purpose sense versus the specific eBay, Google, and Amazon model, right? We're building it for everyone's apps, not for one app. And that's pretty darn hard. The hybrid cloud, how do we give our customers a choice about where they run those apps? Because actually that's what they want, choice. And then finally, how do we enable those apps to be safely and securely consumed anywhere, anytime, on any device? Because guess what? Most of the apps are being written to be run on consumer devices, on phones and tablets, not on desktops, not on laptops. So this stuff is, for us as a vendor, I look at it and I say, this is an area that is very rich, rich in opportunity for helping our customers, and thus an opportunity as a business. The academic, the curious person inside me says, this is a space where there are lots of really interesting problems to be solved. And I'll leave you with one tidbit, which is either, I don't know, you could see it as uh, patronizing or divine wisdom. <laughs> There's usually a fine line between them. Quite often, they're the same thing. For me, when I look at this stuff, I don't look for great solutions from people. What I look for is people who ask great questions. What I hope you end up coming away with from your education here and from your high school or anywhere else 
is that you learn to ask questions. Because finding the simple answer, finding the answers, finding simplicity is about finding the angle where the question is actually a simple question and the answer is self-evident because you asked the right question. So be curious, ask hard questions, look for simplicity, and I think you're going to have a really exciting time in your career academically or out in industry and in the enterprise. With that, I will shut up because I've gone over massively, and I appreciate you having spent the time with me. Thanks. Yeah, I'm still here, so I've, I've got nowhere else to go yet. We're going to the beach, right? <laughs> so when we think about it, as I said, when you look at, um, you look at the public cloud infrastructure today, Amazon, Google, um, Azure, what you're really looking at there is it looks very different to our customers' data centers. Uh, the application models and patterns are different, the way you build them, the way you manage them. I would also argue that the, the customers actually end up locked into them because when you code to those environments, you, it, it, simplicity is the seduction, right? You sit there and go, EC2, S3, it's simple, I'm not going to get locked in. And before you know it, you're using their messaging, their database, and their management software. And before you know it, you can't, you're locked into their runtime. But the trouble is you're not just locked into their runtime, you're locked into their physical data center because their runtime doesn't run anywhere else. So for us, we're trying to create a public cloud infrastructure that exposes the same operational model, the same principle of operations, the same abstractions, the same nouns, verbs, whatever you want to call them, as our private cloud infrastructure. So when our customers look at it, they see the cloud as being an extension of their data center. They can use the same people, the same tools, the same processes. Now when they do that, that means that their use of the private cloud, of the public cloud, is purely constrained by their willingness in terms of risk of where they put data and nothing else. It's a business choice and not a technology choice. Our belief is that all businesses will be hybrid. They will consume infrastructure, platform, and software from both a private environment for certain things where the data mandates it and compliance and trust, and they'll get a large percentage and have a larger percentage from outside. <coughs> Excuse me. Startups don't even look at having private infrastructure anymore. And I would argue most SMBs will never bother with it in the long run either. Why would you want to have, why would you host an email system? Yet almost everyone does. Why would you bother? It's a waste of money. Yes? Oh, could you wait till the microphone gets to you? Because I'm sorry. Then you, there you go. I'm not going to let you get away with not asking the question. But uh, uh, we, have used, we have started using mobile devices and... Uh, Cloud systems have uh, mainly come to offset the storage capabilities and to put that on the cloud. Will there come a situation where powerful applications can be run on the cloud? Uh, we have just scratched the surfaces with Office and email clients and stuff. Uh, will MATLAB and other powerful applications be running on the cloud? And processing power will be used by, the mainframes processing power will be used by mobile devices. Yeah, so I guess paraphrasing your question, you can tell me whether it's right, is Will things that we don't consider to be trivial consumer applications end up running in the cloud and interacting with mobile devices? And the answer, I believe, is yes. Um, you already see pharmaceutical companies running genomics and stuff in the cloud. Um, it's not common yet, but I think it will become ever more the case. The risk with running big data applications in the cloud is data has mass, right? It's like gravity. When you put data somewhere, it becomes, as it gets bigger, it becomes very difficult to move. It becomes difficult to move because there's too much to shove down a piece of fiber. It becomes difficult to move because when you move, you make a copy. And when you make a copy, there's a data governance issue. Who's had the data before me, and is it a true copy? And then when you move it, you may move it between regulatory domains in the same country, between healthcare and defense, perhaps, or between countries. So where that data ends up is going to be a very sensitive question for businesses. But I think you will see all of these services out there uh, in the cloud, because what it's doing is democratizing innovation for the small guys. Those services will be out there. Even if the big guys don't put their own out there, there'll be people who will develop open source analytics infrastructures, put it in the cloud, and a whole bunch of people will be able to start using it and doing interesting stuff. So I, I sense there's an inevitability of the stuff going out there. But the big businesses will always have that mix because they'll want some of that back inside, and they can do some things more cost effectively still themselves. So I think that kind of answers. And I think this gentleman here in blue, because I think... You started asking, but I couldn't hear adequately because I'm going deaf in my old age because all those drums. 
Uh, given the recent NSA scandal, many organizations are going to be apprehensive about putting their trade secrets in the cloud. Yeah. So do you think the cloud systems can ever be made as secure as private IT systems? Um, in the long run, yes. So there are lots of ways of delivering security. Um, the Snowden affair is kind of interesting. Um, so I did work for the UK government. Did I say that? I used to work for the British Ministry of Defense. That was my first job. I wrote something that looked suspiciously like Google Maps back in 1984, uh, but of course it was secret. <laughs> um, what we, I, I think we will solve those problems, but I think that what we end up with doesn't look exactly like what we have today. You already see it with Angela Merkel and in Europe wanting the traffic not to go across the fibers across the Atlantic. And in fact, the Brits are the most guilty here because we're the ones who tap in when it comes ashore in Britain more than anyone else. Uh, GCHQ has been slurping up data uh, more than anyone, including the Americans, uh, because the, almost all the internet traffic goes across the shores of Britain. Um, I think we will solve those problems. I think we will absolutely solve those problems. Um, depending on what you do with data in the cloud, if it's suitably encrypted and flight on its way there, and you spread it across the stuff, it's almost impossible to reconstruct. There's lots of ways. The difficulty is if you want to act on that data in the cloud, because if you want to act on it in the cloud, right now we don't have a good way of acting on encrypted data without decrypting it. But I think we will address a lot of these problems. And the other thing that I think is happening is that your generation, dare I say, it has a different set of expectations around security and privacy to my generation. My daughters are perfectly happy to put everything about their relationships and their life online. Now eventually they'll pay a price for some of this, but it's undeniable that even with that, their expectations will be different to mine. And so I think our notion of what we think of should be private and what is secure, I think, will be different. But I think we'll fix these things because there is just so much momentum, such a desire to take advantage of what cloud gives us in terms of the ability to innovate and change. It democratizes so much. The one final thing that I think is so important, that democratization only comes if we can reduce the digital divide. That it is profoundly important for enabling change across the whole world in countries as long as people can be connected. And that is, I think, one of our really big challenges, making sure people are educated enough to use the technology and giving them access to the technology. But once we have those things, this is going to change. You know, my wife came around India 17 years ago. She spent seven months going around the entire country. This is not the country she visited 17 years ago. And the United States today is not the country I moved into 15 years ago. It's changing incredibly fast. And I think it's stupidly exciting. There's a vast amount of opportunity. So with that, I'll say thank you, and I'll shut up and go away. Oh, you're breaking the rules. Is this the alum that I get preferential treatment thing? Is the legal framework evolving at the space at which things are changing here in the sense of ownership, IP, what is private, what is not, who owns what? Is that evolving at the same pace? No. How do you deal with that? I'm sorry? How do you deal with the fact that the legal um, framework is not supporting this rate of change of technology? I don't know. I think I don't have a good answer. What I do, th what I, when I think about it myself and I ask myself about it, I often have these discussions in business too. There's, there seems to be this thing that for our generation perhaps where there is a bifurcation between those people who are technologists and those who are not. And so when you talk to a CEO or a CIO, they'll always say they want to speak, a technologist, they'll say, to be effective, you have to speak the language of the business and understand it. I would argue that the language of business today is actually technology and that we need better trained people who understand technology. We, we don't need just lawyers in government. We need technologies in government. We don't just need businessmen and MBAs as CEOs. We need technologists as CEOs. Because technology is that weapon of mass disruption. Technology is the way you differentiate. Technology is the way you get stuff done. And without that intimacy, and if I look at my children's generation, my four-year-old, my nine-year-old, they're quantitatively and qualitatively different in their approach to technology to my 21 and 23-year-olds. Fundamentally, and I think when that generation is there, we'll get a different set of answers, and I think it'll move at a different pace, because it's just their worldview is just so fundamentally different. Okay. Thank you very much for hanging out for so long. Thanks, Paul. And we have a small memento. From this. Well, thank you very much.
That's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Oh, that's so cool. I, I, I particularly like the leaf because one of the things I said this morning when I came onto the campus was actually how beautiful it was. I've never seen a banyan tree before. Now I've seen thousands. Very, very impressive. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure.